Let's just open with a word of prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, I just uh, pray right now, Lord, that you would uh, restore those who are not able to be with us. Uh, in particular, Lord, we ask your blessing on the Millers uh, and also, uh, Lord, uh, a Jewish friend that I know who, who really needs prayer right now uh, and I know would uh, appreciate our prayers even this night. Lord, as we seek truth from your word, uh, Lord, as we seek a revelation by your Ruach, by your spirit tonight, that we might draw closer to you, that we might be more conformed to the image of your son, as I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer, ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Uh, jumping right in uh, to the Torah portions, um, last week we saw that uh, Sarah had died in Hebron, Hebron uh, and Abraham purchased the cave of Machpelah for her burial. And then Abraham sent his chief servant to Haran to find a wife for Yitzchak, for Isaac. And the servant returned with Rivka, Rebekah, and for Isaac, it was love at first sight. Uh, very romantic, right? But not all was perfect, uh, as we see at the start of this week's portion, and as we read earlier. This week's portion begins in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 25, verse 19, uh, and is called Parsha Toldot, which means genealogy or history, referring to the history of Isaac, who... Uh, According to verse 21, as was the case with Sarah, Rebecca too is unable to conceive. Tonight we will see that there are actually a number of similarities in the lives of Abraham and Isaac. Isaac's wife's barrenness being the first that we will uh, come across. This is like a sequel intended to reinforce God's sovereign choosing of Isaac. As opposed to Ishmael, it is Isaac as the one who will receive the promises that were given to Abraham. We're also told, as we found earlier uh, in that same verse, Genesis 25, 21, that as a result of Isaac's intercession, Rivka does become pregnant. And as you all know, it's not just one child, but twins. And the Lord tells Rebecca in Genesis 25, verse 23, there are two nations in your womb. From birth, they will be two rival peoples. One of these peoples will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. This is actually a theme that we will find often uh, in the lives of the leaders of Israel. Can you think of any others? Uh, you know, we have um, Isaac and Ishmael that we, we just talked about. How about Joseph and his family? Uh, David and his brothers? Ephraim and Manasseh? And Judah and his older brothers, just to grab the main ones. And uh, if you want, you can go looking and you may find there's more because I learned about this pattern uh, at one of the conferences I attended, uh, uh, teaching by Russ, Re Rabbi Russ Resnick, uh, who wrote a book called Divine Reversal. And the point of the book was that Yeshua continues the pattern. When he says things like what we find uh, in Matthew 20, verse 16, that the last will be first and the first will be last. And actually, Yeshua actually also fits the pattern. Uh, in that he was not the conquering king the first time around that they were expecting. But he came the first time as, as what? As the, the servant riding on the donkey. When Rebecca gives birth to the twins, the firstborn is red and hairy and is named Esav, which means, now you have a 50-50 chance, and the Hebrew word for red is Edom. Uh, so, it, which we'll talk more about later, but Esav, uh, meaning Harry, becomes Esau in the English. Uh, the younger twin is named Yaakov, meaning he catches by the heel or he supplants, and Yaakov becomes Jacob in English. 
kind of wonder sometimes why Asav didn't become Harry, but that's a different story. <coughs> Excuse me. Because of his hunting skills and Isaac's taste for game, Esau is his father's favorite, we are told. Jacob is described as a quiet man who dwells in tents, and he's Rebecca's favorite. And two children, being the favorite of two different parents, is what I would suggest using a culinary term, sounds like a recipe for disaster. And we will see in just a moment that Jacob has a recipe for red red that Esau can't resist. When one day he comes in hungry from the field, the Hebrew says, and Jacob has cooked ha'adom ha'adom, literally the red red. Uh, in exchange for this food, Jacob requests Esau's birthright, the extra portion that goes to the oldest child. And Esau agrees as he seemingly allows his hunger to overrule his appreciation for his birthright. How often do we let the physical, uh, what is ever taking place at the moment, seem to demand more of our attention than the eternal truths that are real to us. That's why, you know, we can lose our temper. Um, you know, we can yell and scream and, and argue and, and, and various other ways that that can be manifest rather than reflecting on how, how much we have to be thankful for in that God not only gave us salvation as a free gift, but he gave it to us despite the fact that we do not deserve it. Uh, in any way, shape, or form, we are not able to measure up to his standard of righteousness. Genesis 25 verse 34 says, Thus Esau, uh, Esau showed how little he valued his birthright. As a result, it says, Esau would be called Edom or Edom. That means that every time he was called, he would be reminded that he had allowed his fleshly hunger for the red stuff to overrule his appreciation of his spiritual blessing. And, you know, it, it's easy to say to ourselves, Esau, how could you? Um, because we would do so much better, right? You know, it, it, it's um, easy to, to judge when we're not in that situation. Now, remember, Esau had no control over being the firstborn. That was God's doing. But like Esau... There may be things in our lives we can't control, but we do control whether we accept his purpose for our lives or whether we decide we're going to make up our own rules. We're going to live according to our own desires. Do we seek God's purposes for our lives or do we go through life telling God about his mistakes? Like, I wish I were prettier. Well, not me. But I, I'm speaking for, for all of us, right? I wish I were more handsome or richer or smarter, or luckier, or Jewish, or not Jewish. You, you can fill in the blank, but you have to realize that when we make those statements, we're suggesting to the Lord that he made us differently than he should have. In Hebrews 12, verse 16, Esau is described using a Greek word that means profane or godless, because according to the verse, he gave up his birthright for a single meal. The birthright was not simply this blessing that was bestowed on you. There were also responsibilities that went along with it. One of the reasons for the birthright is because the oldest was expected to assume the father's responsibilities when the father could no longer carry them out. The, the, um, the, one, the oldest, the, the firstborn, was expected to carry on the work of the father. The children of Israel are also described as the Lord's firstborn in Shemot, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. And unfortunately, like Esau, many of them have given up their birthright. They have failed to fulfill, fulfill their calling to be a testimony to the world of God's faithfulness. But today, through the Messianic Jewish movement, Many Jewish people are once again testifying to the world of the work of our Heavenly Father, carrying out the work of the Father, being faithful to our calling, uh, demonstrating his faithfulness to us. 
In Genesis 26, verse 4, Isaac receives a promise from the Lord that is similar to what was promised Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 3, and chapter 18, verse 18. The Lord tells Isaac that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and that they will be a blessing, a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Now, I have a question that I want you to think about as we examine uh, really the next verse in, in Genesis uh, chapter 26. And that question is, did Abraham follow the Torah? According to Genesis 26 verse 5, yes. the Lord tells Isaac that he is making these promises to him because of Abraham, who, according to the Lord, did what I told him to do. He followed mitzvotai, my commandments, Kukotai, my regulations, and Torotai. Often translated as my laws, Stern translates it, as you can see, as my teachings. At least that's how he translates it here. The exact same word in Jeremiah 31, verse 32, he translates it as my Torah. Yes, long before the Torah was given to Moses, Abraham followed God's Torah, his instructions, which is what Torah means. <coughs> and that is why Yeshua said that he did not come to do away with the Torah, or the prophets for that matter, under the Brit Kadeshah, under the final covenant renewal, the new covenant. But in this final covenant renewal with the Jewish people, it says he, or actually it says, I will put my Torah in their inward parts, and write it on their hearts. Chapter 27 brings us to a time when Isaac has grown old. He isn't able to see very well, and he can't find his glasses. Uh, just kidding. Um, but shortly before his death, with Rebekah's help, you all know the story, Jacob puts on Esau's clothes, and he puts some goat skins on his arms so that he will seem hairy like Esau. And as a result of the deception, Jacob receives the blessing that Isaac had intended for Esau, a divine reversal, as we mentioned earlier. Isaac's blessing of Esau includes, you will serve your brother, but when you break loose, you will shake his yoke off your neck. Esau decides that he will indeed shake Jacob's yoke off his neck. He decides that he will kill Jacob after their father dies. But Rebekah finds out and sends Jacob to her family uh, in Haran, where he will find his future wife, or actually wives, uh, Raquel and Leah, uh, daughters of his uncle, Lavan, or Laban. Unlike Esau, who according to Genesis 26 verse 34, married two Hittite women, which is a disappointment to Isaac and Rebekah. And then the Torah portion ends with Esau marrying a third woman, and this one is a descendant of Ishmael. So in tonight's Torah portion, Esau has married three women of whom his parents disapprove, has sold his birthright for some boiled lentils, and is planning to kill his brother. No wonder the Lord said through Malachi, as David read earlier, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. You know, there are skeptics who believe that man has made up the Bible because of all of the other religions have man-made sacred texts, such as Islam or the Mormons, for example. But if man were making this up, surely he could have changed the wording a little bit to say, Jacob, I loved, and Esau, not so much. And some translators try to soften the terms, but my literal, tra literal translations all say hate both in the Hebrew of Malachi 1.3 and the Greek of Romans 9.13. Hate is used because it is the polar opposite of love. And throughout scripture, we find another pattern, the pattern of a duality, the use of pairs of polar opposites, such as love and hate. We're to choose love, even though our flesh would rather hate. Similarly, we are to choose good, but our flesh continually acts selfishly and chooses evil to satisfy our own selfish desires 
often at the expense of others. We're to choose light. But our flesh would have us believe that we can take advantage of the darkness to hide our sins. We are to choose life. But the world tells us death can be more convenient. Death of the unborn. Death of those diagnosed with birth defects. Death of the elderly. Death of the depressed. God tells us choose life because our lives are given to us as a gift from him. We're to choose blessing. The blessing comes with obedience. We, if we're honest about it, often choose the curse because we would rather rebel against his ways and trust in our own understanding than be obedient to his instructions when we have to trust in him because we aren't able to figure out the situation. We don't have to figure out every situation. He already has it figured out. It almost makes more sense to trust in him, but not according to our flesh. Our flesh likes to say, hey, I got this, okay? Don't need no instructions. Don't need no help. I got it. I got it. It's all under control until it all turns out wrong. And then what do we do? When all else fails, we read the instructions. We get out God's instruction manual right here, the scriptures. That's where we find out how we're to live. That's his written revelation that contains instruction for all of us. Sometimes his instructions may come to us by the Ruach, by the Spirit. He may give us a revelation that he will confirm through others. He can open doors for us. And he can close doors as well. But we have to be walking with him. We have to be able to hear his still small voice to know what doors he is opening and what doors the world is opening or the adversary is opening or we just kicked open with our foot and decided, thank you, Lord, for opening that door. I need it open. When in reality, we just wanted that door open for our own agenda. We're to choose blessing, but sometimes we experience cursing. But in these pairs, these opposing pairs, ultimately what we are told to do is choose between right and wrong. Little gray area in between. Spiritually, things are often this black and white. God has made it simple for us. We should say, thank you, Lord. Because the world doesn't always make it that simple for us. Such as, uh, in terms of God making it simple, salvation. There are really only two options. We either accept God's way of salvation or we refuse it. There's lots of people who make this a whole lot more complicated. But the only way of salvation is through God's provision of his son, Messiah Yeshua. In John 14, verse 6, Yeshua says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Accepting his sacrifice on our behalf is the only way that anyone's sins can be forgiven. It is the only means of atonement, and it is by his blood being shed on our behalf as required by Leviticus 17, verse 11. It's up to us whether we accept or reject the gift of salvation that God freely offers. It's hard to believe it can be that simple. The world makes it so complicated, but the reality is we cannot achieve salvation on our own. We cannot achieve righteousness on our own, but the creator of the universe already knows that, and so he has provided the way. And all we, <coughs> all we have to do is be willing to yield to him. And say, okay, okay, Lord, I accept your way of salvation. Say, thank you, Lord, for providing forgiveness for my sin, even though I didn't deserve it, even though I had done nothing to deserve it. You nonetheless, because of your unconditional love toward me, have provided that way. And then we're told, how do we live out our salvation? How do we live out our faith? We're to demonstrate that same unconditional love one towards another. And when we try to love someone who doesn't deserve to be loved, 
we gain a greater understanding of what God has done for us. It works out really, really well in, in relationships. Marriage is, is really a good place to start. You know, in, in the world, half of all marriage, marriages fail. And if we acknowledge the reality, it's not all that different in the believing body because we're trying to do it the same way as the world. The world says, I will love you if, and different people fill in the blanks different way. God says, I love you because I love you, because that's my character. That's who I am. And I want you to understand how much I love you. So I give you the instruction. Try it. You'll see that it's not an easy thing to do, but it is such a blessing when you do. And all of a sudden, relationships that uh, are now, uh, instead of being based on what we get out of the relationship, is much more about what we put into it. And that's the same as our relationship with Messiah Yeshua. We're not to ask him, Yeshua, what are you going to do for me? And, and I'll believe in you. I'll, I'll trust you. But it's, what can I do for you? How can I serve? Because he said he didn't come to be exalted. He came to serve. And, and that's how we are to be with one another, that we are to see serving as a blessing. There are even some in the world who understand that. There are some who live their lives to serve others. And yet there are believers who are all about, oh yeah, God, you know, pour out that glory spout upon me because, you know, the, the self rises up even spiritually and says, you know, what's in this for me? Whereas what we should be saying is, Lord, what can we do for you? How would you have us to serve you? How can I fulfill my calling in an even greater way? Now I got to figure, oh, uh, let's take a look at the Haftarah portion for this week. Uh, it comes from uh, Malachi or in the Hebrew, Malachi, uh, my messenger, uh, beginning at the beginning of the book through chapter 2, verse 7. And in this passage, the Haftarah portion, the Lord is depicted as a father with the Israelites as his ungrateful children. And the Lord charges that he has raised them and nourished them, and yet they have rejected him. His love is displayed in the blessings that have come to Jacob's descendants. And missing out on his love is seen in the experience of Esau's descendants. Malachi records that the land where Esau, Esau's descendants have settled, called Edom or Edom, has been made desolate by the Lord. It also says, as we've already talked about, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And it also reminds us that the land of Edom refused to allow the children of Israel to go through uh, and, and to provide uh, food and water when they were willing to pay for it. And so uh, these are the descendants of Esau, not even looking out for their own uh, kinsmen, but allowing this, this rivalry uh, that was proclaimed from the very beginning uh, continues to fester through the, the descendants. Now, there are many who believers who would not be at all surprised to find out that a God uh, will use the term of hating someone in the quote-unquote Old Testament. But their theological apple cart takes a tumble when they encounter Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated in Romans 9.13. As Shaul, it, uh, Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, is explaining the election of the Jewish people, reminding us in Romans 9 verse 11 that the election of our people is based on God's sovereignty, that it is while Jacob and Esau are yet in the womb. This is a very interesting uh, lesson that Paul takes from this uh, Torah portion, really. While Jacob and Esau are yet in the womb, the Lord tells Rebekah, the older will serve the younger. Paul wants us to understand that this was not based on what they had done. God's election is not based on works. It's based on his sovereign choice, which argues against replacement theology, the idea that Israel has been replaced as the chosen people of God because of their actions. Replacement theologians accuse the first century Jewish leadership of denying Messiah. 
which is true, and conclude that this action has caused God to change his mind about their election, which is false. In taking this position, ironically, the replacement theologians, without realizing it, may very well be guilty of denying the sovereignty, the kingship, the authority of God himself, while often at the same time denying that there is anything they themselves can do to fall out of favor with God. God can change his mind with Israel, but according to them, not with them. Go figure. The enemy is really good at confusing us, but God's truth will ultimately prevail. Paul argues in this passage, there's no injustice in God's election of one over another because the Lord gets to choose on whom he will have mercy. Just like Jacob and Esau, we are all sinners who deserve death instead of blessing. God's choosing to bless Jacob despite his imperfections is not an injustice. It's a demonstration of God's mercy where Jacob doesn't get what he deserves which gives hope to each one of us because we too are imperfect and we need his mercy just like Jacob did. Amen? Amen. When we question God's choices, his sovereignty, we're acting as though we're on his level, just like Adam and Eve and the men who tried to build the Tower of Babel. Isaiah 55 verse 9 tells us his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. In other words, he knows what he is doing even if we're not able to figure it out, which should comfort us and give us hope in the midst of the hopelessness that exists for those who are trying to figure out what's going on in the world today. Look around. Is human reasoning and our technological advances causing things in this world to get better or worse? I thought you might say that. Back in the 60s, we, you know, the, the love child, uh, hippie, um, peace generation. You know, we, we, we thought we had it all figured out and we were the dawning of the age of Aquarius. There was going to be world peace. It, it had to be just around the corner uh, as, you know, it was all about just showing love towards one another. And instead, here we are, I don't know, 60, yeah, almost 60 years later uh, and, um, it's, it's worse now than it was then because the problem is not our inability to love one another. The problem is our humanness, that, that we need God's supernatural power in our lives to be able to love the way that he loves, to be able to um, see things in this world the way he sees them, to bring hope to a world that looks around and has no explanation for the evil that exists. And a lot of times the solution is to accuse others of being evil so we don't even have to deal with our own evil inclination that we don't want to admit to, but the Bible describes very clearly where it comes from, how it got here, and how we get rid of it. Perhaps, you know, what we see going on in the world today might be better explained in terms of a spiritual battle being waged by the adversary in Hebrew, Hasatan, Satan, who continues to inspire those that would come against God and to even turn their wrath on his representatives, his physical representatives, Israel, the Jewish people, and his spiritual representatives, the entire believing community, most of whom call themselves Christians. We, we see this world. Uh, it, it does not understand and, and it accuses us of the same thing that it is guilty of. But I thank God tonight that I don't get what I deserve. How about you? We deserve death. And instead, our loving, righteous creator offers us eternal life by offering up his son on our behalf. We selfishly hurt others, and yet he offers his love to us. Will you receive tonight from the Lord what you do not deserve? Perhaps you've never really experienced the unconditional love of God before. This, as I've said, you cannot find this type of love in this world. 
This love was demonstrated when he offered up his son Yeshua as the acceptable sacrifice for your sins and mine. Will you accept this love, this act of love on your behalf tonight? I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never accepted Yeshua, but you would like to receive the love that I have described, the unconditional love of God tonight, all you have to do is signify by raising your hand and putting it right back down. We always give this opportunity. Is there anyone? Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we have so much to be thankful for. And I thank you that I know many, if not all here, Lord, have made the decision to accept Messiah Yeshua's sacrifice on our behalf. But I want to address those of us who have already accepted Yeshua's sacrifice. Perhaps you've accepted the sacrifice, but you have not been accepting the way that God made you. Will you accept his sovereignty tonight? Will you allow him to use you just as you are from this day forward? Will you trust in him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding? As we say to him, in acceptance of his sovereignty, not my will, but thy will be done. Or maybe you thought as believers we could live any way we wanted, but you now realize just as Abraham was obedient to the Torah, to God's Torah, to the Lord's instructions, we need to do what Yeshua said in John 14, verse 15, where he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you feel the Spirit of God is working in one of these areas or perhaps even some other area that he may have shown you in your life tonight, I would just ask you to raise your hand to acknowledge your commitment to allow him to work in your life in one of these areas that we might uh, draw closer to him and be more conformed to the image of Messiah. Is there anyone? Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we don't get what we deserve. And we thank you that by your grace, you sent Messiah Yeshua, your son, to offer up his life that we might have forgiveness for our sins. We thank you that you sent the Ruach, the Spirit, to help us to better understand your ways, which we know are higher than our ways. And we acknowledge your sovereignty, and we thank you that you love us, even though we won't deserve, don't deserve it. You accept us just as we are, and that you have a special purpose for each one of us as we seek to better understand your love in the days ahead, as we seek to live out your truths in our lives, as we seek to fulfill the calling that you established on our life while we were yet in the womb, before we had even taken a breath in this world. And Lord, we humbly ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everyone said, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you all.